Thank you for being here. And I usually begin speaking by thanking you for being here because after 17 years of not speaking, those are the first words that I said. And I also want to thank all of the speakers here today who are just uh, so tremendous and I've learned so much from, from being here and listening to them. Um, I want to just tell you briefly, right up front, for 22 years I didn't ride in motorized vehicles and 17 years I didn't speak. And that's because after witnessing an oil spill in San Francisco Bay, I gave up the the use of motorized vehicles. I just wanted to do something and I started walking. A little while after that, I was arguing with everyone so much that um, I decided I wasn't gonna speak for one day just to give it a rest, right? And because I was a really um, good speaker. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I didn't speak for that one day and I learned so much in, in not speaking that uh, I decided that maybe I should uh, not speak for another day and another day. It went for 17 years. And I, I want to tell you a little bit about that story, but um, <clears throat> what I learned on my walk across the United States, it took me seven years and one day to get from the West Coast to the East Coast. And during that time I w walked, I got my undergraduate degree and my my master's in Montana, my undergraduate in Oregon, and my PhD in Wisconsin at the <laughs> University of Wisconsin. Um, I know, it's kind of crazy. My dad was following me. I want to tell you about that. But I want to tell you right up front, because you have this clock here that's going tick, 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 tick. tick. <clears throat> this is Ted, right? And I want to tell you what, right up front what I learned in that uh, 22 years of walking and 17 years of not speaking and studying right up to a PhD degree in environmental studies, I learned that we are part of the environment. And I also learned that because we're part of the environment, environment then must mean everything that we do with each other. So it's how we treat each other. It's human rights, civil rights, economic equity, gender equality, all the ways that we treat each other manifest in the environment around us. And so I want to go back to that time, but I have to tell you another time in South America when I first started riding in motorized vehicles because, I mean, that's how I got here. I did not walk here today. <laughs> And, uh, and so as I walked across the United States and I did some things and I sailed down through the Caribbean and I walked um, the length of South America, it was on my way um, from Venezuela to Brazil that I passed through a, a small uh, prison town called El Dorado, a very infamous prison town. And I, I was uh, asked by the guard to show a passport and I had come to this conclusion that uh, I was a UN Goodwill Ambassador, and, and, and I, but I thought I was escaping something because I had this disguise on. I mean, I didn't look like this. <laughs> you know, I had a banjo wrapped up in kind of a ballistic kind of cloth and a big backpack and big kind of beard. Pasaporte, pasaporte. Passport? I'm a prisoner escaping, right? That's what I'm thinking. I don't need to show you my passport. I'm a UN Goodwill Ambassador. My name is Dr. Francis, and I'm walking around the world. Well, they didn't shoot me right off. <laughs> and so I, I got to walk on, and, and as I was you know, walking on, you know, I realized that, God, what was I thinking to talk like that? I don't talk like that. I am in prison. It's the prison that I had made of my own free will. I was talking now, but that's because every year I ask myself, does this still work? And, but I never ask myself, did walking still work? And I decided that um, it didn't work and I had to 
let myself out of that prison. And so I didn't know that I would be a PhD. I didn't know that I would be a goodwill ambassador. I didn't know that I was going to leave my parents, and I probably would never see them again. So for Christmas, I got in a bus and drove back to Caracas and flew home and scared the hell out of my parents <laughs> who thought I was going to be gone. But um, anyway, so I want to go back to how this all began and, and, and tell you a little bit about this journey that we're all on. And that's what I want you to understand, that this is not just my journey. This is our journey. And as I am part of you and you are part of me, as um, Jill said, you know, it's the right hand and the left side or whatever that is, um, maybe we don't have to have a stroke to get there. So um, back in California, I saw two tankers collide, and um, I heard it on the radio. I wanted to go see it. I told my girlfriend, come on, let's go see. Gene, let's get in the car and go see. Oh, yeah, I don't see nothing, honey. I, I don't see it. You see it? No, I don't see it either. Gene didn't sound that way. <laughs> this is a theatrical device. You know, everybody uses that, you know, theatrical device. And I just don't be confused because we are in California. And... Uh, Jean said to me, she didn't see it. I said, I couldn't see it, but we could smell it. It was just tremendous. It was something, the first time I could ever in my life feel that something had happened that you couldn't get away from. Well, maybe that's not true. Um, <laughs> environmentally speaking. Uh, and so um, we couldn't see the spill, but we could smell it. And we could see that there were birds washed along the shore. And we decided that we had enough of that. We heard on the radio, someone said, look, if you, you know, if, if you can't, if you don't like the news, go out and make your own. And I thought about that. So on the way back, I said, Gene, we're going to make our own news, right? We should get out of the car and start walking. Gene said, that's nice. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Jean said, you know, she couldn't do that because, you know, we actually didn't have any money. But we were going to have money. And this is the sign for not having any money, just in case you guys want to know that because that comes at later. Um, she said, if we didn't have any money and we're just going to be walking, you know, people are going to look at us and say, look at those bums, those hippies walking, and, you know, and they're not going to do anything. But if we had money, we had lots of money, people would say, look, they're walking. They must be uh, rich people. They must know something. You know, this was way before Forrest Gump, so <laughs> who knew? Um, anyway, uh, we got back home. Jean said, you know, listen, um, we can't walk until we get some money. But there was a knock on the door. And at the door, there was somebody that told us that the deputy sheriff, a friend of ours, well, not quite a friend, because he was always pulling out the weeds that we were, had growing in our well, I, <laughs> It's another story. I did inhale, and I guess you, should, I guess you can be president now. <laughs> I'm not running, though. Um, and so, you know, I, I said to Gene, our friend, the deputy sheriff, Jerry Tanner, was lost in the bay. Let's go on a walk to celebrate his life, which we did. We went to walk to hear the Youngbloods, who were friends of ours. They lived right in the town, and they sang this. How many people know the Youngbloods? Yeah, you old guys, right? <laughs> now, they sang a song that's, you know, still popular. Uh, come on, people, smile on your brother, everybody, get together. And I got to stop right there, else then I'll have to pay residuals. Um, but they were going to be playing about 20 miles away, so we decided we would walk there. And um, we left at about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, we were going to get there um, at 8 o'clock. 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, uh, yeah. Um, if you've walked 20 miles, you know that you don't want to leave 3 in the afternoon in order to get there in time for anything. So we did get there in time about 1 o'clock in the morning. And uh, they were all, you know, singing their last song. And they were said, John, Gene, come on, let's, we'll take you back to, you know, Inverness, which is where we live, and uh, get in the car. We said, okay. Nah, we're not. <laughs> we're going to stay here, actually, and we're going to, you know, rest up. We did it, the Holiday Inn, and we're going to walk home. 
By the time we started walking home, I had been thinking about our friend Jerry Tanner, who was about the same age as me. He was about 26 years old. Um, he had a beautiful wife, family, house, you know, white picket fence, great, you know, job, deputy sheriff. And, um, and just like that, he was gone. And, and I realized that, oh my gosh, that could happen to me. And so why was I going to wait for the money to come in order to start walking? And I said to Gene, I said, Gene, listen, we don't have to wait for the money. Let's just start walking now because here we are. And Gene said, bye. <laughs> she wasn't that cold. She just said, you know, John, I had so much to do. I can't stop right now in, in order to, to walk. I have court cases. How are we going to get any money anyway? And so I decided that I was just going to keep on walking because I realized at that time that now was all we had. There was no promise that tomorrow is going to come. There's no promise that the money was going to come. And so I just started walking. And I called my mother and father up and I said, Mom, Dad, listen, I have given up riding in cars because of the environment. What? My dad wants to know why I didn't do this when I was 16. <laughs> They're back in Philadelphia, and the environment probably hadn't reached them yet. Uh, so um, yeah, that's, and I'm really happy. Uh, OK, thanks, Mom. My mom said if I was really happy, I wouldn't have to say so. Mothers are like that. <laughs> and so you know, I started walking. I kept walking around in our town that we lived in, and people started saying, you know, John, that's really crazy. Somebody said that. Uh, was that you, John? <laughs> If they said, you know, I'm really crazy because one person can't make a difference. One person cannot make a difference. And um, I argued with them back and forth. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so on my birthday, I was turning 27. I was really getting tired of the arguing part because here I am walking around and having a great time, but I'm arguing with everybody about what I'm doing. And they say I'm crazy, and maybe I am. So I decide on my birthday I'm going to not speak for one day. This starts to get familiar now. Um, so I decided not to speak for this one day, and I just shut up. Well, people got really scared in my town. They thought this was, a, this is in the 670s, right? <laughs> this is 1973, I stopped talking. And so there was, this is a sign, this is the end of the world. You know, the Aquarian age is coming, and the end. Uh, some people said, no, he's just crazy. You know, I always knew that. <laughs> Other people said, well, you know, I think he's on a trip, you know? <laughs> All kinds of weird stuff. And so I had to write my parents hmm, right away because they didn't know that I wasn't going to call them up anymore. Oh, air mail came back to me. Oh, yeah, my mother says your dad will be on the next plane. Because um, they think I've been taken over by a strange California cult. Now, why would they think anything like that? <laughs> My dad comes out, he sees me walking down the road. Gene picked him up at the airport, and they stop, and they come to talk to me. And I go to my dad. <laughs> and my dad goes. <laughs> but I go to the hotel where my dad is, and we talk. Well, I'm writing notes, because he doesn't want to play sign language games with me. It's good. My dad leaves me alone. He says, calls my mother up. He says, look, this is, this is great. People like him here. He doesn't smoke. He doesn't drink. But, you know, this isn't going to work in Philadelphia. Let's hope that he just stays here and we'll just <laughs> <laughs> flies back to the East Coast, leads me to my own devices. And my devices are to just walk and play the banjo, which I do. I learn how to play the banjo. And just walk around until finally I'm walking up to, to the Kamiopsis Wilderness in Oregon to get a little bit of green because I don't know what what really environment's all about. So I get some time in the wilderness area. I'm not speaking, uh, I'm painting and writing every day, um, playing the banjo. I come out of the wilderness and I want to go to school. <laughs> I'm in Oregon, so I decide to go to school in Oregon, Oregon State College, and um, I go there and I go. They look at me, you want to go to school, right? <laughs> They figured that out because it was a school, and there I was. Uh, <laughs> I graduated, and uh, my dad comes out, and he sees me, and he goes, hey, look, we're really proud of you, son, but you got to start riding in cars and talking if you're going to make any kind of difference in the world. And I hunch my shoulders, put my bag back on a banjo, and I go off, and I get all the way to Montana. I get a master's degree. I'm still not talking. Oh. 
My dad comes out again. You know, he says, hey, listen, we really are proud of you. You get a master's degree. But what are you going to do with a master's degree? You don't ride in cars and talk. <laughs> Hunch my shoulders. I walk all the way to Madison, Wisconsin, and I get accepted for a Ph.D. program. And I get a Ph.D. I mean, I finish all my exams. I'm studying oil spills because that's why I'm walking. Nobody cares about oil spills until when? 1989, Exxon Valdez happens, and everybody in the world wants to know about oil spills. There's only one guy in the United States studying oil spills at a PhD level, says the Admiral. Let's call him up. He's in Wisconsin. <laughs> what do you mean he doesn't talk? <laughs> Is there someone normal there? <laughs> well, my major professor talks to him, and I, my dad comes, he says, you know, look, my sister said to leave you alone because you seem to be doing a lot better when you're not saying anything. <laughs> I walked the rest of the way to the East Coast. Took me seven years and one day, and on the 20th anniversary of Earth Day, I started to speak again, and I said thank you for being here because I was thanking the people who had come to hear me speak because I had this message, and that message I'm going to say again. <laughs> the message is that we are the environment and if we are the environment, then how we treat each other is our first opportunity to treat the environment in a sustainable way or even to understand what sustainability is. And so it's got to be human rights and civil rights and economic equity, and that's a bunch of things that people are sitting in, the, in, in, in New York and all over the world now. Economic equity, what does that mean? Gender equality and all the ways we relate to each other. So as... One of our speakers said, and I think it was uh, Steve Jobs, you have to have faith to go out and do that crazy thing. And you'll know it because it's someplace right in your heart. And that's what I'm asking you all to do is to go out and do that thing in your heart and be that person. And being that person, your authentic self, is going to be great for all of us. Don't be like anybody else but who you are. And I'm going to play this as the time counts down. 